You can have just a bottle. <laughs> we've had we've had a few of that bottle. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs>
Welcome Kate Rogers uh, here. We were chatting a bit before about her um, background and history and uh, Kate originally started out training in history and archaeology in Australia um, and then through various, um, I guess, serendipitous reasons ended up um, experimenting a bit with filmmaking through uh, her early training. And then that led to a series of other things that eventually put her on a master's program at one of the top um, universities in Australia studying documentary filmmaking. And then she decided she needed to return to archaeology. <laughs> and so moved to the UK to start her PhD at the University of Southampton. And so I think Kate today is going to be telling us a bit about your ongoing um, PhD uh, research, which is very timely and fits in with a lot of bigger questions, I think, and um, issues around impact and uh, presentation and interpretation of the archaeological record and more. And um, so I'm really excited uh, to well, we've been talking about her coming up for a year and a bit now, so it's great to have her here. For those that are listening on the um, live stream, we you can tweet us questions on <laughs> the audience is waving to you. Um, <laughs> you can <laughs> um, tweet uh, on yours y o h r um, s or just catch us after the fact. Send an email um, to Kate. Uh, I think she's happy to take questions and so forth. So, anyways, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and thank you very much to the Department of Archaeology here for having me. Um, yes, as, as Sarah said, uh, my research investigates the relationship between archaeology and documentary filmmaking. And my overall aim for my research is to problematize this relationship. And critically, I'm, I'm hoping to examine archaeology filmmaking as an archaeological activity. Um, so heads up if you attended my talk at WAC. Uh, <laughs> this is an expansion on that. This is actually the original script, uh, script which I sort of whittled down to 15 minutes for WAC. Uh, and so this is all of the context and a lot more um, detail about the numbers as well, because ultimately my research is qualitative. So we're going to be seeing a lot of quantitative information, but I'm looking at experiences and I'm looking at attitudes as well as rates of engagement with documentary. So. Um, the other thing that I, I want to stress is that this is, as Sarah said, this is ongoing research. So this is really the first component. I have three components of my PhD. Um, I've got the survey. I have a case study, which is going to be an older ethnography of a film about an archaeological excavation, which I've, I'm in the process of making at the moment. I'm in the edit for that. Um, and I have an upcoming interview series. So this is part of a larger project. There's wider context, context to this data, so please Keep that in mind, and if you have any suggestions or feedback, I'm all open. Um, so, uh, so why does this relationship matter between archaeology and documentary filmmaking, and who does it matter for? Whoop, whoop. Oh yeah. So, um, <laughs> I missed this slide. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, documentary plus archaeology, archaeology documentary. Um, something that I discussed with Sarah is exactly how I'm defining documentary. I'm not just talking about television. Um, the slide, I've, the picture I've got here is Hoop Dreams. Uh, you may or may not know this film. This is a film from 1994. Uh, it was one of the first commercially successful documentaries ever in that it made a profit, enough of a profit that they were able to actually give a substantial amount of the money 
back to the two key participants, um, which almost never happens in documentary. Um, so I'm, when I'm talking about archaeology documentaries, I'm talking about this, them in this very wide context of filmmaking, um, going right back in time to the beginning of documentary um, and its early roots and its predecessors as well. Uh, so I'm not just talking about factual television, but we'll, we'll come, come to that a little bit more soon. Um, so yes, it's been long established that archaeology documentaries, particularly on television, are a significant means of communicating archaeology. You can see here that when compared to other forms of archaeological communication, like museum visits, uh, site visits, books, magazines, even public lectures, uh, <laughs> that TV, TV is one of the most popular forms, um, usually documentary and television, uh, as well as film, for people to access archaeological information or representations of archaeology. Um, you can also see uh, that archaeology documentaries have an extensive audience reach. So, for example, Time Team at its peak, which was around 2001, was drawing in 3 to 3.5 million viewers per episode. Um, and that's a nice, healthy, sustainable audience. It's nothing like the British Bake Off, which was like 11 million viewers. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's nice, you know, broadcasters like it for that particular topic, that particular time slot. Um, but none of this is new. 50 years earlier, for example, Buried Treasure in 1954 was according to BBC statistics, and I need to check these, uh, it was pulling in a total of 5 million viewers across that year, which is a lot for 1954. Um, and they estimated that that was 11% of the UK population. So, you know, if that's true, then it means that 11% of the UK population in 1954 had watched an archaeology documentary, which is no small stuff. But um, also in 1954, the then Director General of the BBC, Ian Jacob, even claimed that the most popular subjects on British television at the time were archaeology and show jumping. Uh, <laughs> so it's come, it's come a little bit of a way, but archaeology stuck around. Um, we also know, coming back up to, to the 2000s, in the 2015 Warwick report that while museum and site visits again were socially, they were found to be socially exclusive. So they found that people visiting uh, museums, they found that 87% of visitors were from higher economic social groups and 13% were from lower socioeconomic groups. But they also found a drop in the study period between 2008 and 9, 2011 and 12, 3% for the higher group and 12% for the lower socioeconomic group. And also differences in populations. So this is black and, and minority ethnic. Um, so that's what's that? That's like 15% roughly, just on the difference um, according to ethnic. Uh, backgrounds. But then on the other hand, across all demographics, we see an increase of consumption over 2005 and 2006 and 2012 and 13, um, from 49% to 71% of film and television. So, so we're reaching different audiences, which is something we need to keep in mind when we talk about reaching mass and broad audiences, exactly who are we communicating to in all these different forms. Um, similar findings from Kulik and Pacini's research. Uh, Kulik, when she was researching the relationship of archaeology to media, found television is the public's second favourite means after site visits for engaging with archaeology. But for those who rarely or never visit museums, television is their number one source. And again, with Pacini's research, she found that disadvantaged social groups are clearly engaged with TV heritage, and television appears to be a major source of information about heritage for those without computer access. That may have changed, it's 10 years ago, but still, again, we can see the predominance of TV for broad access. Um, and we know that that audience reach does translate into actual, oh, whoops, I'm jumping ahead again, uh, <laughs> into an actual impact on viewers. So, for example, Chiara Bonacci's research in 2013, um, she was looking at Time Team fans, and she found that through her study of Time Team fans, that they were more likely to, lo and behold, visit archaeological sites, pursue archaeology as a career, um, and understand the aims and methods of archaeology. So that's a form of impact that she found. Um, we also know anecdotally that archaeology documentaries and non-fiction filming, so new, newsreels, have been used to fund archaeological research projects, which have included excavations, experiments and reconstructions, and lab-based research for well over half a century. Um, so Glenn Daniels talks about this. He talks about 
this you know being as an extension of the previous relationship with print. Um, but I also included this picture of Silbury Hill from Chronicle. Um, some of you may know about this one, uh, if, you, if you were alive then, uh, or, or, or a fan of Chronicle like I am. Uh, <laughs> basically, um, the BBC sponsored this excavation, and they had this notion that there would be a treasure in the center of the hill. So they tunneled into the center of the hill, and lo and behold, there was no treasure. Um, so it was, it, some people saw this to be a, a flop, um, and that this maybe had a negative impact on archaeology's appeal for broadcasters because you couldn't uh, prove that there would be a grand fine, um, even though they actually got great data about how the hill was built. Um, but also, apparently, they, they did do some damage to the hill. It wasn't, yeah, anyway, so that, that's a contentious case study. You know, there's a lot of um, discussion about it. Um, but anyway, so that's what this research project is about. Oh, oh, no, one more thing. Um, there's been a lot of calls for research. I just want to acknowledge some of the people who have, that this is not a new topic that I'm coming into. You know, people like Kramer have been bringing this up since 1958. Um, in science and communication, there's been calls for more case studies of, of translating uh, different forms of science and academic research uh, to, to um, popular culture and mass uh, dissemination. Um, but there's a lack of case studies has been identified. Carol Krulik found in her PhD that, well, she said explicitly, archaeologists and, and media practitioners need to be surveyed about their attitudes towards an experience of archaeological communication. And then more broadly speaking, I'm sort of tapping into this wider discourse about archaeology as a mode of production with Shanks and Webmore. So that's the sort of background context coming to this research. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, so my, um, my PhD is about charting and problematizing this gap in our knowledge about the production of archaeology documentaries and the production of archaeological knowledge within this filmmaking context. The key word here is filmmaking. My focus is on the act of production. I'm looking at that process of transferring and creating archaeological knowledge in a filmmaking context. So that's for me, filmmaking includes, it was good that we talked about this before. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not just about cinematic film. Um, it includes, uh, in the way that I was taught filmmaking, it includes animation, includes virtual reality. That's being used more and more in documentary now. Um, and it includes, yeah, uh, I think for me, for documentary, it, it doesn't matter what the medium is. So long as there's storytelling, so long as it's creative storytelling, but it's based on reality or actuality. Um, I'm counting that as documentary. Uh, the focus for my research is on the UK. And yeah, and as I've mentioned, I've got three key components. Um, yeah, so yeah, so Sarah and I, I'm really glad we had this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to head up about this image because it's on the poster. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking very broadly. So as I've mentioned, for me, documentary filmmaking is, is not just on television. Um, I just uh, I just wanted to share this one because I think it's a, it's a bit of a treasure in and of itself. This is a screenshot. You can watch this online on BFI's iPlayer. I think it's the oldest example of an archaeological film that I found so far. It's a panorama of Stonehenge from, they, they attribute it to 1900. Um, but I've seen archaeologists who say that's not 1900. Uh, so, so you know, we don't know because you know this archival um, records are not always uh, watertight. But um, this would have been a travel log. Uh, this would have been shown as almost you know it could be in a tent, it could be in a town hall, um, in an event almost with other short films, with other acts, with music, with all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, so something else we need to acknowledge is the context in which documentary works. Um, which is, you know, it's cinematic context, it's early cinema, and how we view it today, whether that's on a mobile phone or on the TV in the living room or, on, or through Netflix, um, that all plays a role. But again, storytelling, uh, actuality. Okay. So, for the survey, um, yes, I ran this survey in May 2016. I just ran it for one month. Uh, and the aim of the survey is to profile archaeologists' rates of engagement with uh, and experiences of and attitudes towards archaeology documentary filmmaking. Um, so I'm effectively mapping out 
this sector of archaeological activity. Uh, the survey covered a 10-year period, going back to 2006, and my target respondents were UK-based archaeologists working on or participating in UK-based productions. So if you moved from the UK but you did your production while you were over here, then that's fine, I'm including those people. Um, as I've said, all forms of documentary. Uh, I had 35 questions, but I think it's quite important in, in terms of the survey de design that every question came with a comments box. So people could elucidate on their answers, or they could call me out on my questions, and quite a few people did that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and the other thing is that this survey dealt with an unknown popula uh, population. We don't know who works in this field of activity. There's no paper trail. I can't look at credits and assume that I know who was involved in this film, who hit the cutting room floor. Um, so as a consequence, there's no existing sampling frame. So I used an exploratory non-probability sampling strategy, which basically meant, with permission, that I spammed all these organizations uh, with emails and asked them to share the survey. And um, yeah, to share the survey. Uh, and I was surprised because, yeah, everybody agreed. They seemed very keen. Um, but also I did a social media campaign and asked people to share the survey through social media channels as well. So through those two strategies, I pulled 652 hits to the survey site and that ended up um, producing 139 completed usable surveys. So according to the numbers that I got from Atchison and Rocks McQueen in 2014, that's approximately 5.5% of the UK archaeology population. So hopefully an adequate representative sample. Um, so, if we go to the findings, who are our respondents? Um, I found that the average respondent, so the average UK archaeologist who has been involved in documentary filmmaking in the last 10 years, is a 43-year-old male who lives in England, uh, is a, has a white British ethnic background, a master's degree or higher, and works in the university sector. So the main difference between my profile of my average respondent and um, the profile generated by Atchison and Rox McQueen, more broadly of archaeology in 2014, was simply that my guys are more university-based and their respondents were mostly based in commercial archaeology. Um, Atchison and Rox McQueen also raised the issue of ethnic diversity. They found that 99% of working UK archaeologists were white in their sample, compared to 86% of the UK workforce. Um, and so because of this, they characterize archaeology as socially exclusive. And we can say, see that the same pattern occurs here. 98% of my respondents were white. Um, tonight, I'm not going to go into comparisons between my results and similar phenomena and other surveys for the other questions. Um, but I am going to do it for this one just very briefly, because um, I just want to give you a taste of where this survey can, where I'm hoping to take this survey beyond where it is now translating it into a wider me media conference. So this difference in uh, this issue of, of diversity, um, it's the first difference we find when we're translating archaeology into documentary form. There's currently a lot of debate about diversity in the media. You might have seen it on social media, <laughs> Matt Damon. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's a lot of debate about this in social media, uh, uh, in the media. And in terms of how this affects what's commissioned, and who we end up seeing on screen. To give you an example, I attended Sheffield <coughs> Dogfest in 2015, and I went to all of the factual commissioners panels, which was heartbreaking. Sheffield Dogfest is like a, um, it's a conference. It's one of the top three film festivals and conferences for documentary in the world. It runs every year at Sheffield. It's wonderful, and if you get a chance to go, you should go. Um, but I went to all the commissioners panels, which is basically when everybody sort of touches base, all the commissioners pitch what they want, and everybody then for all of the production companies attend and then they follow up with meetings afterwards. Um, and something that happened across all of these different commissioning panels, uh, something that was said by representatives of the BBC, Channel 4, National Geographic, Discovery, Vice and so on, is that they all agreed that they want to see more diversity in documentary presenters. This is part, for some of them, this is part of their PBS remit to reflect the diversity of the UK population but they're looking to academia to provide that. Um, so if we don't have that uh, and we can't give that to them, then they're gonna go looking elsewhere. Um, and so this is potentially an issue. Um, 
I should also point out that diversity in archaeology documentaries was not something that was flagged in survey comments very much as being an issue by respondents. There were some mentions of gender, but not of ethnic diversity or other socioeconomic groups. This doesn't automatically mean that respondents don't think or care about these issues. It's not something that I asked explicitly for because I didn't want to ask any leading questions. Um, but I do think that that absence might have a meaning. The fact that it's a very active discourse in the media at the moment, but archaeologists are not thinking of it as the most pressing issue when they're talking about archaeological representation in the media. Um, and I think that that difference could be worth exploring. But I don't think a survey can adequately do that. So that's why I have these other components of the research, so that I can go into these topics and do respondents justice and actually find out what's going on if there is anything going on. So yes, that was a long answer for these ones. The other, I'll, I'll be quicker when I'm going through the other uh, findings. Um, so in terms of rates of engagement, the majority of respondents' experiences in documentary oh, occurred within the last five years. Um, and most of them have been in two to five documentaries. But we can see that we've got a few who've been over in over 50 um, and one who's been in over 100. So there's a diversity of respondents there. Um, and people's experiences. The most common type of documentary that people had taken part in was factual television series. So for example, Time Team, a format which is repeated every week. It's the same episode. If, if it feels like it's the same thing every week, that's because it is, it's designed that way. That's what we mean when we talk about factual formats. So factual television series and factual television one-offs were the most common, um, but also a few taking part in web series and a few other forms. 0% of archaeologists, of, of respondents, had taken part in feature-length documentaries for cinematic release, which I thought was interesting because that's something that happens in other countries, but maybe not so much here in the UK. Uh, and 0% had taken part in iDocs, but that could be because nobody knew what an iDoc was. Uh, <laughs> so that could be something I need to pull out of the survey, is the terminology I've used as well. Um, so yeah, that's something I need to explore. Most common roles. 49% of respondents had uh, taken on the role of key participants, so for example, interviewees, and 24% um, as just being a normal participant. So for example, present in wide shots, or having a minor or non-speaking role. 4% uh, of respondents were presenters or hosts. Um, this other section is interesting though, this 13%. Uh, when people elected the other kind of roles that they'd had, They'd had a range of roles from being a field archaeologist working behind the scenes, so doing all of the work but the camera's not looking at you, uh, <laughs> which, you know, could be part of a contract. People might not want to be filmed. Um, people worked as fixers, so they had, you know, done all of the groundwork, driving people to sites, helping, you know, the producers find where they're going to film, uh, coaxing farmers to let people on. Um, that's, that's the role of a fixer. It's essential. Um, some, uh, some people had worked as producers, some had worked as editors, uh, and people had also created graphics which were used uh, by the documentaries. So this is important, again, when we're talking about that invisible labour that's happening behind the scenes, which you don't necessarily get a credit for. In terms of the time spent per year working on archaeology documentaries, 54% spent one day or less, so eight hours or less. 28% spent one week or less, but we did have a small section who had spent over four weeks, so um, over four weeks or over three weeks. Um, this is interesting because one of the main concerns in the comments was uh, a concern that uh, about the time that archaeologists had spent working on archaeology documentaries. People felt like they were spending too much time working on them, um, often unpaid. Um, so. That is, you know, that concern is kind of in contrast to the fact that we're spending less than one um, day per year, apparently. So that's a bit of a contradiction. We're either under-reporting how much time we spend, or we're over-reporting the impact of that time upon us. Um, but in any case, the time archaeologists spend working on documentaries is felt to be significant. And because attitudes and beliefs affect activities, like whether or not you're going to work on another documentary, then that still plays a significant role. In terms of conditions, the most common type of agreement uh, that respondents had with production bodies was um, the participant consent or release form, which is standard um, internationally, that's standard. 
this could be something that's written, <laughs> probably printed out, but it can be something that's written on a napkin uh, <laughs> in terms of how it actually works when you're in the field. Um, so, so that's not a bad thing. 13% uh, were verbal agreements. I don't know if that means that it was something that was just expressed verbally or if that was actually caught on camera. If it's just expressed verbally, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, it's not legally binding. Um, others had other employment contracts. So, for example, you know, they're just doing this part of their existing role, their existing employment. Um, only 2% had actors or artists contracts, presumably hosts. Uh, but worryingly, where are we? Yeah, 15%, no contract, nothing at all, which means no rights. Or it means that you can pull out and <laughs> they have to, uh, you know, not use that footage. Um, but that's an issue. But then again, like I said at the beginning, you know, the numbers tell us one thing, but the comments tell us another. So we have some attitudes, which is that yeah. <laughs> the release clause for the broadcast was so all encompassing to cause significant laughter on site. It used a phrase similar to in perpetuity across the universe. <laughs> um, but then we also had respondents who said, uh, TV agreements may not seem fair, rights in perpetuity, but they are standard. Archaeologists can do more by taking control of the means of production. So we have, you know, yeah, a diversity of people's responses to these documents. Um, yeah, and it also depends on the conditions of your other existing work, which we'll go into. But this one in the middle is the worrying one. I have no real concept of what is the standard in the film industry, so I simply sign what is given to me. So yeah, I think we need to give some attention to that uh, because that's an attitude that leaves archaeologists at risk of mistreatment, <coughs> as well as misrepresenting what we do. <coughs> uh, in terms of pay, when asked if usually paid for their role in documentary, 56% were not paid, or mostly not paid, I should say. 31% uh, were mostly paid, um, yet yeah, in kind. Uh, so that could be, I don't know, a book deal, a uh, hat, food. 11% <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, NA, those, were, those tended to be people who, as I've mentioned before, were um, paid as part of their employment. So this was just part of their nine to five job for say a, a museum or something like that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're not very well paid, but when asked if this arrangement was fair, interestingly, um, 32% said yes, this is fair, 29% uh, said no, and 26% were undecided. So we're on the fence about whether or not we should be being paid for this. Um, and something else that was expressed in the comments was that this is part of our vocation, you know, so, so we're willing to work for free. Um, not everybody agreed with that, but it was a, it was a pattern that emerged. And yeah, this one speaks to that. When asked if they would be willing to work for free if it was for a worthwhile cause, 76% said yes, overwhelming majority. Uh, in the comments about these questions, uh, again, you get an uh, indication of the range of attitudes that people had. Um, so yeah, always paid, I won't do anything for free and I've had to fight for it. I think this respondent was somebody who'd been in quite a lot of documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it, it indicates that it doesn't necessarily get better, you know, the more experienced you are and the more more years you have under your belt. Um, but this is interesting. Payment was very quick and the deal involved free food and accommodation. Overall, a good deal compared with commercial <laughs> <laughs> uh, And then uh, here, um, we are now having to pay journals to publish and disseminate our work. So for documentary makers to do it for free seems like good value. So we, we can see that we're judging this relationship according to our other relationships, our other work conditions. Um, and also, yeah, the institutions we're working for. So for example, as a museum, we benefit from the publicity. It brings viewers and saves us commissioning films for ourselves. Um, but then I thought this was a very strong reaction and telling. Um, since the demise of Duck Time Team, we've lost TV programs that do archaeology. Nowadays, the TV companies are parasitic on current projects. <laughs> there is little real money going into the archaeology. So again, you know, that notion of give and take, that economic relationship, not just for the archaeologist as an individual, but for the project and, and what people are expecting. It hasn't been mapped out at all. We don't know what it is, um, but you can see that it's, it's a concern. Uh, rights as participants. I should point out that these top two are based on people's experiences, 
and the bottom one's just opinion. Um, so when asked how often they've been invited to review archaeology documentaries before their release, 70% <laughs> had never been invited to review archaeology documentaries before their release. Um, that could be an issue because, but then it depends. This is one of those differences between factual television and independent documentary production. And it depends on the kind of roles that people have had. So I need to, to break that answer down really according to sort of the roles people have had. Because if you're a key participant, um, you should have a right to review. That's good practice. BBC, again, at Sheffield Doc Fest said, yes, we always give our fixes and our key participants a right to review. Um, you know, uh, I mean, so so it is something that a lot of filmmakers actually expect to do if they can. Um, but then it kind of also depends on if you hit the cutting room floor. Uh, <laughs> and if you're not particularly used as a, as a participant, then they might not consider you to be key anymore. So yeah, it's a, that's a, that's a gray area. In terms of editorial rights, 72% had never been given editorial rights. Um, the main reason I include that, <clears throat> that's quite normal across documentary filmmaking, but for both of these, and again, this is one of those interesting things about being in the UK and looking at UK archaeology. My background's in Australia. I do a lot of Aboriginal archaeology in Australia. When we're working with Aboriginal groups, they have a lot of rights, you know. Uh, and it's it's and that's that's instituted according to the state as well. So you won't get funding if you don't do that. So that means that there's leeway in there, um, and it depends on who your participants are. It depends on the story you're telling, but it is something that we should consider, you know, that this is not impossible to have these rights, but they also come with responsibilities and there's a context to them. Uh, in terms of how archaeologists think that they should be given editorial rights over archaeology documentaries, the majority answered, 40% said sometimes. So I think that's quite a reasonable response, personally. Uh, <laughs> nobody, I mean, there was a small section of 21% who said always. Um, but generally, we, we're, we seem to be quite open, and the responses, the comments, um, express not only why there's such concern, which can be things like the stress about being edited, as you will inevitably have your words taken out of context. That word inevitably, I mean, that's a trust issue right there. Um, and that taps into a mu much wider media um, conflict that really kicked off in the 90s, this crisis of trust in documentary. So that's very justified response. Um, I mean, they're all justified, but uh, here we go. Production companies rarely seem bothered about the facts. Misrepresentation work can seriously affect careers and livelihood, so there should be a veto under normal circumstances, is what this respondent wants. Um, on the other hand, this respondent is saying we have to accept that uh, program makers are trying to tell a story and it may not be the same as what we would tell. Likewise, this respondent is saying, actually, you know what, the filmmakers are responsible to commissioners, so they may not even have the, the choice to be able to give us these rights. Again, um, when I get to compare these to other surveys, like those done of documentary, there's a lot of agreements that filmmakers don't tell the commissioners. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of work that's done before the films get to the commissioners in terms of trying to meet participants' rights. There's a lot of debate about ethics in documentary, um, but again, a lot of it's off the books, off the record. And the bottom comment, censorship, concern about censorship. Where do we want to draw the line in this relationship? How much do we want to demand that is within our right to say how a story should be versus how much we're willing to sort of compromise? Um, it's something that, yeah, we, we, we need to decide, maybe not as a discipline, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's something that people have brought up. So, <coughs> In terms of opinions on, represent, on representation of archaeology in documentary, I need a glass of wine now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> in terms of accuracy, when asked, <coughs> do you think documentaries represent archaeology accurately? 41%, the majority response, said no. I'll be surprised. Um, but interestingly, and when asked if documentaries represent archaeology fairly, 44% said yes. Um, they were the two dominant things. So it's not accurate, people are saying, but it is kind of mostly fair. Um, what's the difference between, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> what's the difference between accuracy and fairness? 
Um, I mean, because this is something which is also debated in, in documentary. When we talk about accuracy, we talk about fact checking um, and people making sure that what they're saying is, is correct to the best of their knowledge. Um, fairness, on the other hand, is sort of a more wobbly word. Um, and it's more about how it's treating a site or an idea or a discipline overall. Again, the comments show that there's no consensus on accuracy or fairness, but mostly accuracy. Um, but interestingly, I thought there was quite a, a fair degree of self-critique. So um, yeah, so some people are saying, you know, it's just not possible in this business. I, I love this response. I could barely watch the one I was supposed to be the consultant for and ended up shouting <laughs> at the screen at the inanities of it. Um, and this person is, is very self-critical, but our archaeologists are not self-critical, critical of archaeology. Archaeologists are bad at representing archaeology accurately in our professional and academic reporting. Um, and in this one, we get the coverage we deserve for better and for worse. It's incumbent upon archaeologists to get better at communicating, not lambast media people for not understanding us. And then on this one at the bottom, it depends on what you mean by accurately. I think there is no way of representing archaeology accurately. There may be possible ways of representing it. So again, no consensus. But I thought it was quite telling that everybody's like kind of turning the mirror back on archaeology without really being um, invited or pushed to. It seems to be something that we we do, which could be a good effect of documentaries, maybe. Um, I also asked, oh, are celebrities that archaeologists beneficial for archaeology? Because that's something that comes up in the archaeological literature. And overwhelmingly, uh, well, not overwhelmingly, is it? Yeah, 56% uh, of respondents said yes. Um, but again, in the comments, they break that down partly by gender, um, a little bit, <laughs> but mostly by specialism. And that was another sort of bugbear that a lot of people had was people stepping outside of their specialisms. So that was a pattern. <laughs> oh, well, oh no, come back. <laughs> uh, and finally, media literacy. On whether archaeologists felt that they adequately understood the nature of documentary filmmaking in the wider media industry, a clear majority of 67% said, no, we don't understand documentary in the media. But they also felt it went, it was the same in, in reverse. 60% of respondents did not feel that filmmakers understood archaeology. But again, in the comments, they said, actually, the, the sort of dominant response to this question was, we care more that they're good filmmakers and that they listen to us than that they have a background in archaeology. So um, so that was interesting, what people are expecting from the relationship, ideally. And then, do you think UK archaeologists need better training and support? Um, a clear majority, again, 67% said yes, except for one person who said it was a leading question. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was a little bit. Um, the majority of respondents were in favour of training, but they weren't sure who was who should be responsible for this um, or the format of delivery. So people suggested that this should be done by production companies. They suggested it could be an online forum. Others considered uh, suggested professional development, um, or even saying that it should be an obligatory part of university courses. Um, <coughs> some people felt that there were more pressing issues, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so. So yeah, it seems that people are keen for it, but we just don't know um, exactly what the parameters of that could or should be. So that speaks to Kramer's going back to the call for research and Kramer saying that archaeologists, saying this in 1958, archaeologists need to learn to communicate in this form. So that brings me to my con conclusion. Um, today's snapshot profile of the past 10 years of UK archaeology documentary filmmaking has shown that UK archaeologists carry out, as a body, UK archaeologists carry out substantial work on both sides of the camera, at little remuneration and taking what they feel are significant personal and professional risks. There is no single dominant narrative of this activity. Instead, it's a field of activity that's characterised by people with diverse and nuanced experiences and attitudes. The work of these archaeologists as translators of archaeology is a vital role for our discipline, but it follows an unmarked and possibly treacherous path. Great rewards like audience reach and impact, <laughs> sorry, 
impact, we were talking about that yeah. word before as well, um, can equally turn out to be a career damaging failures. Still driven by their passion, many of these archaeologists continue and endure in this activity. So how can we translate these results into meaningful action? Well, one suggestion that I have that trying to jump the gun too much on research, which I'm still in the middle of, uh, <laughs> um, I just like to point out why did I call this talk <coughs> Shooting Archaeologists is because I stole the title from an organization that exists, which is called Shooting People, which is a support mm. network um, for filmmakers, not just documentary filmmakers, but any independent filmmakers <coughs> who are working outside of the broadcast system. So, you know, you go off, you produce mm -hmm. your film, you try and get a production company on board, um, but more likely, you know, you're, you're seeking your own cast and crew and your own funding and your own expertise, and then you're on the forum asking, why is my editing system crashing? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and also, uh, you know, it's a, it's a source for legal advice as well. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, it's, it's just one of the ways that this very disparate community of filmmakers support each other and find out information and cross-check. And perhaps that's something we could consider doing in archaeology. Um, perhaps it's time UK archaeologists not only gave this potential subsector of archaeological work and its practitioners not only more academically grounded and rigorous critique in terms of output, but also more understanding and support, acknowledging our own active roles um, as in, in filmmaking and maybe even establishing our own networks of support for archaeologists who work in or with documentary and other media forms. And in doing so, then we can locate archaeology's place in documentary, and documentary's place in archaeology, and to paraphrase from Michael Shanks, then and only then can we begin to define what kind of archaeological documentary we want and what kind of discourse that should be and how we can be the ones to make it. Thank you. That was fascinating. Just really fascinated by that um, data. And I have a couple of questions, obviously. But, <laughs> Um, I'll, we have the time for others to ask questions too, so I'll turn it over. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you gave a little bit more than from from WAC. It was mm -hmm. good to refresh on that, and I kind of want to see the do the Dogu mine come back. <gasps> oh, <something>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the question that I had, um, uh, are you familiar with, uh, what is it called, um, past preservers? Yeah. Yeah, did, mm -hmm. I think we talked about this a, a while back. Mm. Um, did anybody ever mention things like that of how they got involved in, or how they got tapped to actually um, participate? in any of these uh, No, I mean, I did ask people about their motives for being in in, in it, mm -hmm. but that was more, the responses I got were more people's um, values mm -hmm. um, and, and so what they mm -hmm. wanted to get out of it. I didn't get any origin stories, um, but I am, I am doing an interview series, which okay. I'm hoping to come up in, to do in the next couple of months. So hopefully I'll get a range of people saying how they got involved and what that process was. Um, so yeah, I'm aware of past preservers because yeah. I've got mates who's in it. Uh, <laughs> um, but but also the other thing is that, uh, past preservers is US based. Mm. So that would be for a project after the PhD. Mm. Uh, <laughs> if anybody from the US is listening. Yeah, um, yeah, so my, my definition of documentary, um, I mean, I fit archaeology documentary into documentary. That's sort of the, the approach that I take. Uh, and so as long as it's nonfiction storytelling, um, using filmmaking, whether that's digital or animation or anything. Um, but what it doesn't include, and, and so yeah, YouTube is a platform, but it's still going to depend on the content and how you approach that story um, as to whether or not it can classify as documentary. I've had a lot of people who say, yeah, come make a documentary about my, my dude, uh, but really what they want is a commercial um, or they want something promotional and that could follow a story, but then it's actually documercial. Uh, and, and that's not technically a documentary. A documentary has to be built around a question. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, in terms of defining what documentary is, it's 
one of the last slides I deleted yesterday <laughs> <laughs> before coming here because I wasn't sure about time. But it's we're working off a definition from 1926, John, um, Grierson's definition, which is a creative treatment of actuality. That's one that hasn't died. It's still the one that people are using because it's so open. Um, but it has to have a story. It has to have a beginning, middle, end, whether it's in that order, um, whether you mess with that. Mm. It can't just be, I, I haven't seen your videos, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it can't just be footage. It can't be like ethnographic footage. It can't be um, somebody monologuing. Um, you know, it's it does have some parameters, but, but they're wobbly. Um, you know, we've got a lot of documentary filmmakers who are learning coding now, and they don't even use pick up a camera. Um, so yeah, it's open to some degree. <laughs> it's open, but it's closed. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's where some archaeologists misunderstand the nature of documentary? That in, unless you work in the documentary business, mm. if you're outside it, you think the word documentary is the representation of reality, mm. whereas it's not. Mm. It's the creative representation of reality, which is quite different. Yeah. It's it? oh look, it's a hard. It's it's a really difficult thing because you know you even look at. Again, looking outside of archaeology, um, the, the contract of documentary is that is it's supposed to be evidence. You know, it's supposed to be reality. That's why we tune in, because we don't think yes. it's fiction. You know, um, but yet at the same time, even if you're even if you're like locking off a shot and you're not editing that interview, it's a straight two-hour interview with that person. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't change a thing. Yeah. You're still choosing a frame. Um, which locks out everything, which but means people have long ago deconstructed Grierson's own documentaries. Who Grierson himself, yeah, in yeah. His yeah, documentaries, yeah, you know, absolutely. People, people are rich and apart for not being accurate enough and, and faking things. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah. exactly. Well, look, and even going back before, I think just before Grierson to Ziga Vertov yeah. and Man in the Movie Camera, mm. and that was, yeah, that was a play on on capturing capturing yeah, raw footage absolutely. but then treating it in such a way yeah, yeah it's um yeah. yeah it's the definition of documentary but yeah. but that's not just archaeologists yeah. you know who who find it confusing yes. it's documentary it's, filmmakers yeah. it's commissioners um <laughs> it's uh <coughs> and you know a lot of it comes down to funding um and and that's um, that's something we need to look yeah. at as well um so a lot of archaeology in the uk ends up being factual television um, and there's a big debate at the moment as to whether factual te the relationship between factual television and documentary mm. as a genre. In terms of the history and in terms of the theory, factual comes under documentary. In terms of the funding and in terms of the slots on television and dissemination, documentary comes under factual. Um, so that's confusing as well. <laughs> and, and they both steal from each other in terms of... Um, the visual language they use, yeah, and trying to legitimize themselves. Yeah. And then to go off from that, mm. then that kind of muddies the distinction between uh, documentary and reality television. Absolutely. Uh, because, I mean, <laughs> reality television is staged and, and... It's not really real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. inevitably one of the... Uh, it, it will be very rare that a documentary that's doing an excavation that you're going to have a camera right on something right as they find it. Yeah. So yeah, they staged that again. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about kind of that blending and that muddying mm. of um, uh, from factual documentary to kind of, I guess, history channel sensationalized mm -hmm. documentary mm. Um, and into reality television? Yeah, it's... um. You know what, uh, there's a lot of, again, in the wider documentary sector, there's a lot of stress and concern about this. Uh, and there has been, you know, documentaries as a wider industry has been considered to be in crisis for about 20 years because of, partly because of the impact of reality TV, partly because that's more likely to get commissioned. Um, and people don't want truth anymore. And, and the documentary <laughs> filmmakers are all too busy with their lawyers trying to defend, you know, uh, filming protests. Uh, <laughs> as happened like two days ago. Um, so, so yeah, you know, there's this, um, yeah, there's this wider issue of truth um, and of what is supported and of what is funded. Um, 
And then what people, as you say, come to believe <coughs> is truthful um, when they're watching it and what they expect from that relationship. Um, I'm, yeah, so, so my second case study for my research is um, I've, I've gone and filmed somebody's dig and I've done it in an observational style. Um, and it's still in the edit, so we'll see. One, if they like it, uh, and two, where we take it. But I, I like that direct, uh, not direct cinema, but I like that notion of something that's quite raw, um, which isn't orchestrated, no scripting. I don't prepare anything. I, I don't do formal interviews in my approach to filmmaking. So I do. Fly on the wall. Yeah, or fly in the soup. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in that, my voice is in there as well. You right. know, so I'm open to being criticised yeah. as a player within the filmmaking yeah. as well. Um, and and so I'm I'm hoping to sort of see how that works, see if it works for audiences, see if it works for archaeologists mm. involved, mm. if they like that or not. Um, but it, it would never get commissioned, that kind of work. One, it's too expensive to send somebody to work, live and mm. stay on a dig for that long. They used to do it. They used to make those kind of films. BBC used to commission that in the 80s, early 90s. Mm. They haven't commissioned that kind of stuff for a long time. Mm. It's the same with um, ethnographic television for anthropology. Mm. <laughs> But yeah. but then this comes to looking at that wider ecology of, of documentary filmmaking. So we, we're in the digital turn now, right? So we're streaming stuff, Netflix and, and Amazon and all of this kind of stuff, but also other other companies have popped up online. So you can go to something like Distrify is an Australian one, where you pay like $1 or 50p and you get to watch a film uh, and it's direct and the money goes straight back into the production. Or maybe they have a small cut. 30%. <laughs> but it depends on the platform. Um, but the point is that, you know, so filmmakers are finding ways around the fact that they're not get, getting commissioned, um, that they have to go out and film first before they can bring it to a commissioner to pick something up and put some money back into it. A lot of people are turning more and more towards philanthropy to fund stuff and towards corporate sponsorship for some stuff as well. So if you watch a documentary and there's lots of like handheld Samsung cameras, uh, <laughs> Samsung is paying for that documentary. Um, but people are finding ways to try and tell these stories and documentary filmmakers aren't afraid of breaking rules. There's a lot of stuff which is deliberately shared through piracy as well to get stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff which is free. There was one film, Saving Mezinek, so that's an archaeology documentary which is a US documentary made for cinema cut to one hour for television, but there's a longer version, and it's free for everybody in Afghanistan, if you have a computer. Um, <laughs> but I think they're also, I, I assume they're doing some local sort of distribution as well. So people find ways around it. Um, and yeah, anyway, so yes. Yeah, I was uh, wondering about the responses to the, the questionnaires that you've mm. done. Um, and there are obviously some elements of it were responsive, heavily weighty one way, I thought, gosh, how odd that they're not being paid, etc. Potentially those were there just for a day and they weren't bothered, so there's a little bit of skewing the responses. But mm. what I was thinking was, if the responses had, had all come back in sort of the green zone, that yes, we're being consulted, yes, we have a veto, yes, we're being paid, yes, we're this, 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 mm. would the production of that actually be something that's achievable or watchable? Would it, would it have such an impact? on what you were trying to produce. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so the question... Well, it's, you know, it's, it's all these elements of, well, we haven't been consulted, we haven't done this, we haven't got that. So those, if those elements had all been in the green area, well, yes, we've been consulted on this, and we've been taken on board, and we yeah. understand how production yeah. works, etc. Would it actually just skew the production of it so much that it... Yeah. So, so, so if archaeologists had the final cut, would it be worth watching? It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I think we've got to try it. Uh, yeah. And see. Um, <clears throat> I don't think necessarily so. Uh, I think the ideal is that, and, and you know, we're seeing more and more of these productions. Again, if I pull from my background in Australia, um, you know, we have a lot of these productions where filmmakers are working with indigenous groups. And as part of that, they're giving 50-50 cuts. Um, and actually, it strengthens the story. In fact, it challenges the convention of storytelling. Um, you know, so actually, you know, we can take it there and we can see. Um, and see what happens. That we don't have to, uh, we don't have to assume that there's a right way 
to doing it. There's just a way that works. The other thing to keep in mind is that our uh, documentary works in a capitalist framework as well. So if we can kind of take that out of it, maybe it could be a bit more honest. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it, again, like there is this issue because um, it's an art. It's it's considered an art, but it's actually in the, in in with as a as a product that has to be sold it's been commercialized and this is something which you know people historically debate about what happened to documentary um and its ability to to kind of represent um more widely but no there's no reason like i i mean i showed the hoop dreams um example uh right at the start which was not archaeology it was it's about two black teens who were trying to break through various glass ceilings and they got, you know, enough money back to set up trusts for themselves. You talk about very strong subjects mm. there, you know, things which have a real strong resonance and identity. Mm. Whereas a lot of archaeology could be quite dull and boring. Uh, <laughs> you know, How dare you? <laughs> 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 it, I think it depends on it depends on what you're looking at, and it depends on the angle. You know, like so I've seen uh, outside of in a documentary type way. Yeah, yeah. but I've seen I've seen archaeology, archaeology documentaries from out, yeah. outside of the UK. So I'm thinking of people like the work of Patricia Patricio Guzman from Chile. I'm looking at you know Sammy Mezinek. Uh, in Australia, we had a uh, message from Mungo, which is actually mostly funded by the Australian National University that I'm aware of and, and working with a production company. And um, and those are all things, mm -hmm. films where archaeology is actually, it's either part of a story which is absolutely heartbreaking. You know, these are films which are very powerful and timeless, really. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, archaeology does have the potential. And you know what? Sometimes the mundanity of something is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, like there was a... Um, you know, the the great thing about going to about about when you sort of dive into a subject like documentary is you you watch the host of of, of diversity like films like Shoah that went for nine hours, you know like we there's there's room in there, um, and I watched one film which wasn't archaeology but it, it's ethnography which is you know a bit of overlap from anthropology, uh, which came out of the Harvard Sensorial Ethnography Lab, uh, and that was about people's ex the, the experience of being on a fishing trawler. It wasn't like the one on TV though. It, there was no talking heads. There was no interviews. There was no context given. It was entirely poetry. And I went and watched it at the Melbourne Film Festival. Um, and it was, the background story was about the terrible working conditions and, um, and, and you know, the brutality of the labor. But I went into a full cinema at the end. There was like 30 of us left. Because uh, it had made everybody so sick uh, <laughs> because of the way it was filmed. But it was still, I thought, fantastic. It was five stars, um, you know, and it connected with me. Um, and it had an impact. It obviously got selected by these filmmakers, and it's done very well uh, in critical circles. Um, so, you know, there's, there's always room. We just have to experiment. We have to take the plunge. We have to find somebody very rich to pay for. <laughs> so, um, I have a, well, one question and one more like plea for help. And the, the question is about the data that you presented at the start, mm. because as far as I'm aware, any of the um, surveys that have been done on like actual um, user or viewers of these shows mm. are all at least about 10 years old or more mm -hmm. yeah. now. And I just wonder, am I wrong? Has there been actually some more updated surveys? Out no, there? not that What's I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah. Not that I'm aware of, unless they've popped up in the last six months when okay. I've been having my head down editing. But um, I, yeah, in terms of audience reception, I haven't come across anything new. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is also part of that is you know people shuffling into other fields of research mm. so um you know whether or not this is even a topic which has enough currency in archaeology to sustain research projects and, and be able to get people to fund the research is another matter yeah um but yeah i haven't come across okay. anything new so the other um and there's people in the room who are much more experienced in actually participating in documentaries. Um, maybe they'll want to say something afterwards. But 
I've been involved a few times in, tr in, I've been approached about being in shows from a few different networks from different parts of the world and have, um, you made a comment earlier, which was like, are archeologists telling archeology span badly? <laughs> um, or is there a way, like, you know, I think the way that the kind of bigger way to think about it is that are archeologists doing a bad job at this? Which is maybe not what you're saying, but what I'm worried about is the case for me. Okay. <laughs> or um, are those that are making the films or producing the films telling the stories in a way that's not, not great? And I've had a couple of experiences now where, uh, in the most recent one, a major uh, US uh, network was in touch about doing a show. And so we went through a few rounds of um, exploring possibilities and went in for a screen test. And in the screen test, they asked a series of questions that I could never have anticipated I would be asked. Mm -hmm. And for instance, one of them, was, the first question they, I had was, what's your favorite um, uh, uh, quote from the Bible? <laughs> and, um, and, what, and then it went on from there to what's your favorite biblical, biblical archeology span site? Oh, and, no. and I think that's a situation where I probably answered the question, well, I answered the question as good as I could have, mm. but probably badly in the, in the end. And I, you know, there was no way that I could ever have anticipated that. And mm. ultimately I decided to pull out because it, the agendas <laughs> behind all of it began to become clear. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I guess like, I, you know, I do feel like I would benefit from more advice on how you, because I think going back to this point about motivations for doing it, the reason that I would want to participate is because I believe in the power of, of, uh, TV and film to make mm. a diff make an impact on a on a really wide scale, mm. but then you get into these situations where I could never have anticipated that that would be the types of questions that I I was going to be asked, mm. and I could see how you could actually get all the way into the production phase of it, and then be on the ground there and realize, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. what am I doing? And by at that point, you know, I don't know how you would get out of it necessarily, especially if you have no editorial rights and you're not even allowed to watch the the, the film before it's circulated. So yeah. What's your advice to someone <laughs> <laughs> next time a TV company approaches me? <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, I guess, um, <laughs> I mean, that process that you described, the, the very fact that you were called in for a test screening mm -hmm. is not something, it's something that is completely foreign to me in okay. my training. Um, <laughs> so, and again, that speaks to that difference of, of possibly, I'm, I'm a, I don't know if that was a factual production or not. I don't want to hate on factual to be, too much. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm hating on it. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess the the most, I guess the best advice would just be familiarize yourself with the options. Um, familiarize yourself with what's out there and how it's done. So, for example, again, I'm trained in the independent documentary sector. Um, my lecturers actively hated broadcasters. I don't hate broadcasters. I love them. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, the way that I was trained was that you meet your participant on phone to arrange when you meet them and then you meet them well not the way I was trained the way that I prefer to do it is that you you arrange the dates you give them the the sort of parameters of the filming you don't know what the story is going to be at that stage I didn't for the type of filming I do um but I try to meet them on camera or I try to get to know people through the process of filmmaking so I'm at the complete far spectrum of that um yeah in terms of rights uh, yeah, and in terms of when you sign that contract, um, you always have the right to withdraw. Uh, that's something that's important. That was something that was stressed to me at Sheffield Doc Fest. Uh, even if you've signed, you have the right to withdraw. You might end up in a legal battle, um, <laughs> but um, but there's there's means there. Uh, but it sounds like you were being shepherded towards an actor's or an artist's contract. Mm. And that's something I don't know anything about. Because <laughs> that's a, they have unions uh, <laughs> for a reason. Um, and that's a whole different set of rights and responsibilities to participant consent. Um, 
so yeah, so yeah, I guess that that sort of familiarity, and that's you know, I guess what I was speaking to at the end of having some sort of format forum where people can talk about their experiences, what they've signed, what they haven't, yeah. um, and and obviously you have to be careful because nobody wants slander, um, and nobody necessarily wants to give away certain histories, but um, yeah. We won't know till people sort of share their stories, really, uh, and and that's something that's coming out of documentary as well. You know, again, you know, we've surveyed documentary film. I haven't. People have surveyed documentary filmmakers who work independently, anonymized because people were worried about repercussions. Uh, partly because you know they'd made agreements with their participants to protect them from the broadcasting agreements. Um, you know, so so people made arrangements beforehand because they know what happens. Um, but then also, you know, you also have these experiences. I know editors who and film directors who aren't even allowed to be in the editing room. You know, so they can't necessarily see things through. Um, yeah, it's a it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a mess, but full of good-hearted people who want to share truth and better the world. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Just on that point, I remember seeing some research, of course I can't reference it, um, but it, it fully supported what you found out about the TV um, documentary format being the most popular. Mm. But what, and it was based in the US, but what also came through was trust, mm. and it was the host that people found, thought was important. Mm. So I just wonder whether we're not being pushy enough. Mm. I wonder if we have more power at least the host than we think and mm. you know should be saying okay demanding more i think it's important to know what your rights are going into things um i think it's also it's important to know your responsibilities as well um so and and sort of what's riding on things so so yes i think um i think we we totally have the right to demand things like reviewing although that depends <laughs> a little bit like if you're just walking past the camera you don't have a right to review um but you know if you are involved in something you can you can definitely ask to follow that up put it in writing um because it did seem like the popularity was that host was key that position mm -hmm. and i just wondered if people went oh no i'm not watching it because there's no trusted host or i don't know i mean that's why they have hosts yeah because it's it's you know it's a um it's a process that works you know, having a, a face where people know what to expect. Um, there, there's charisma there. Not everybody has charisma. When you find somebody who has charisma on television and, and can follow direction, um, then that's a very special thing. Um, and and also has the, yeah, I guess the nous to sort of back things up as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, but you know, that's the thing. Rights come with responsibilities. You know, I've had this difficulty as well, where I want to give my participants all the rights in the world, um, and then, and then somebody, uh, yeah, you could have somebody behave strangely, and <laughs> and jeopardize everything. And so you have to keep that in mind as well. Is that this is a that with film productions, especially if they're independent, um, that they, um, you know, they could be running on a shoestring, and that. Maybe nobody's getting paid. Maybe the crew's not getting paid. Maybe this was one of the other findings that came out from a survey by the European Documentary Network and uh, World Wickets Foundation um, was that a lot of filmmakers are actually completely underpaid, um, independent directors as well, uh, and that they're the last to get paid, and it usually comes after the film's out and DVD rights and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, that's a complicated context that we're fitting this all into as well. So, the issue of pay is a really <coughs> convoluted one. There's also for the films, there's this issue of, are we considering these journalism, a form of journalism? And if it is, then is that checkbook journalism if they're paying for information? And people get accused of that and they go to court because they bought somebody lunch and that's considered to be, you know, paying people off. Um, oh, well, that's one anecdote anyway. That's not archeology, span that was something else. Uh, <laughs> but you know, there's that issue of, okay, if we consider these to be a form of journalism, then journalistic standards are another issue that we need to consider um, when it comes to payment and rights. I have a feeling we could probably go on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we will at the pub. <laughs> um,
Well, we're going to head to uh, the Eagle and Child um, now. If you want to uh, join us for uh, dinner and the uh, gossip with Kate. <laughs> um, thank you so much again, Kate, for uh, your time. <laughs> have a yours next week but we're just verifying that we usually have a break in the middle of term when all the deadlines um, happen but just one